morning, everyone, and welcome to our seminar today. My name is Wayne Robertson, and this is Jerry Ross to my left. Service technician for how long, Jerry? Seven years. Seven years. I've been with the company for 15, and today we're going to talk about understanding your RV electrical system. So with that, we're gonna get right started. Folks, you should have had an uh, email containing the flyer that you might see me hold up, uh, which is full of information. We are not gonna word for word this. Uh, there will be some information that we skip over. Uh, we're gonna hit on some of the most important things that we hear a lot from uh, our RVers. Uh, Jerry, you have anything to fill in on that? Nope. All right, well, let's get started into our introduction. First off, what is 12 volt DC electricity? Um, it's electricity supplied by the RV batteries. Now on a motorhome, you might find these under the hood, under the steps. On a travel trailer, you might find these batteries on the front tongue. On a fifth wheel, we might find those underneath in a front compartment. But wherever those batteries are, that is what is supplying our 12 volt electricity. Um, it's stored in the batteries and it supplies power, power for the components and the devices and appliances that require 12 volts. When you're plugged in a campground, your 12 volt AC current is converted to 12 volt DC current by the RV's converter. If you look in the RV's power distribution panel, you'll see an automotive style blade fuse for the DC side. So what does this mean? When you're out with your camper in a field with no electricity plug-in, you can still function and operate the majority of your camper to be used. Your refrigerator can run off propane, water heater can run off propane, furnace can run off propane, water pump, fans, etc. So a lot of those components are usable by the DC side of your camper, the batteries, while not plugged in. Um, charging. In your coach, the charging occurs four ways. The converter, which we just spoke about, the tow vehicle charge line, if that is set up properly from your dealer, the coach chassis charging system, which is in a drivable camper is an alternator, or solar power. And you might see that here in this box. We're gonna to get to that a little bit later. So, continuing to move forward, moving to page number six, what is 12, 120 volt AC electricity? First, before I move on, Jerry, do you have anything to input with the 12 volt DC side? Um, I would just make sure that anytime you are plugged in or towing, or even with a solar panel hooked up, um, to make sure your battery disconnect is turned on. A lot of times that cuts it off and doesn't charge your battery as you're either traveling on the road or a generator running or plugged into shore power to keep your batteries charged. Great point. All right, back to the, the booklet, page six. What is the 120 volt AC electricity? Well, it's the same electricity you use at your house. What well, you plug your curling iron into, your coffee pot, your refrigerator, etc. Same electricity. What it's not, for those out there that might have a large welder, it is not the same electricity as, say, a large welder or a dryer that's an electric dryer in your household. Majority of your campgrounds you'll go to will provide you with an external 120 electric source that you can plug your camper into with your shore cord. Depending on the type of the RV you have or have purchased, <clears throat> it will either be a 30 amp plug or a 50 amp plug. So we've got a couple of examples. Um, 30 amp plug has three prongs and a 50 amp has four prongs. We'll get into that a little later. You must have a 120 volt uh, power source if you're going to use the microwave, your air conditioner, your refrigerator on the electric side uh, mode, and any 120 volt electrical outlets. For example, if you wanted to hook up a laptop and you charge your laptop, you can plug it into the camper, etc. So any of your outlets would be that 120 supply. It is very important to monitor electricity, right Jerry? You Correct. see this a lot. Um, we have to monitor our AC line voltage that's coming into the camper from the campground outlet uh, as a way of protection. The campground electricity can fluctuate. And Jerry, why don't you hit on a couple of reasons why that fluctuates for me? Yep, a lot of the reason um, 
that can fluctuate these days is uh, newer technology, new stuff going on, and the campgrounds really haven't kept up to their time. So you're getting a lot of bad sites that might have uh, bad power. Um, so your voltage power. can drop, you your older your line, stuff like that. Um, these bigger coaches these days have a much bigger demand on things. Uh, so there's uh, not timely upkeep. And um, secondly, it's, uh, it's a very uh, highly market now. So everybody wants to... So the campgrounds are full. Get, so they're getting full now, so everybody's there using it. So that's one reason, well, for a couple reasons why we see a big drop in voltage. Yeah, I'd say probably we see the drop, the biggest drop in the summer season when it is um, a, a high demand with air conditioning. A lot of the campers uh, have at least one obviously air conditioner some have two it's not uncommon even to see three air conditioners so that's where we really see power fluctuate and become low and that can cause harm to your electrical system in your camper so one of the things that um, we recommend that a customer use is find a digital or an analog uh, a digital ac meter and what you can do is plug that right in to your outlet on the wall and it'll tell you what your voltage is, and you can monitor that at any point you're plugged in, whether it's home or at the campground. You can keep an eye on that. Very nice feature, inexpensive, pretty good insurance for the camper. Um, another way that we monitor and we talk about uh, electric, you always should check the, the, the electric at the campground. The plug, making sure that it wasn't damaged by the previous person that was using it. Maybe lightning has struck and damaged the outlet, the pole, etc. And one of the ways to do that, or the easiest way for some people, might be just to check it with a meter. A voltmeter, a multimeter. Well, a lot of us don't have those and carry those. Jerry and I do, but don't carry those in your camper while you're camping. What we offer, what we've seen is some of the uh, uh, surge protectors that you can purchase. These are a couple examples, the Watchdog and the Surge Guard. They have lights displayed when you plug that Surge Guard in. And they light up for proper line polarity. So it will give you a code if you have uh, reverse polarity, uh, knocked out grounds, etc. So this is another safety slash preventative security maintenance uh, item that you could uh, purchase and, and really take care of multiple items at once. So you would plug this in once you have proper polarity and then plug your RV into it. If you plug it in, you have bad polarity, get it checked by the campground, call an electrician, etc. before you plug the camper back in to your surge guard. Uh, moving on, uh, we did speak uh, about our 30 amp and 50 amp short cord ends. Some campgrounds don't often have 50, 30 uh, plugs. You'll have to specify in which plug you need. So if you can't get a campground uh, site that has the correct power outlet, you can purchase an adapter, and we're gonna put up a few adapters here, and we'll get better uh, close-ups of these after uh, afterwards. Is These are adapters that you can plug your shore cord into to adapt up to a 50 amp service site or down to a 30 amp site. So pretty important to have, uh, make sure you're understanding which one they are. Um, they are three prong for 30, four prong for 50, and we're always feeding 110 electricity into our camper, never 220, 240 volts. Jerry, anything to add to all that? Yep, so just make sure, uh, I'll get this question a lot. Well, my camper's only 30 amp, am I safe to plug into a 50? You're absolutely, correct, you're okay to plug into a 50 amp service, either up or down, uh, 50 or 30. Uh, what that does is the, the adapter themselves are breaking the wires and having it so that you're only getting power that you actually need. So you're not ever going to start a fire or um, cause any electrical issues with any of your appliances or anything like that. So the adapter does all the work for you, so don't worry about it. The only thing I have to say about the adapters are is if you do have a 50 amp service and you adapt down to a 30, um, the only thing you're going to want to watch out for is you're most likely not going to be able to run 
two ACs at the same time. You're going to be limited to one, or maybe a fireplace and something else at the same time. So you just kind of have to be aware of watch what you actually use right. inside your coach. Um, the right, before your camper was you know, was accepting 50 amps, but you're knocked down to 30 amps. So that's the maximum you can get from the campground. That's spot. the maximum you're going to be able to get to what your coach is. Um, the other adapter that Wayne didn't quite hit on is the third adapter that we can go from a 30 amp to a 15 amp, just like your house outlets. That's totally fine to plug your coach into that and plug into your house. What we do like to tell people is, is to absolutely all right to run and operate everything in your coach except for any fireplaces or ACs. Those have a too big of an amp draw. Probably not gonna hurt the coach too much, but I really don't know what the wiring inside your residence or wherever you're plugged into. So just stay away from the air conditioner and fireplaces. But totally great to keep your refrigerator cool while you're not using it at your house and keep your batteries charged. Excellent, great. Um, next I'm gonna talk about GFCI outlets. So you will find those on page eight at the top. And we hear this often from our customers that call us. Um, they might have uh, an outlet that doesn't work and they've noticed that it's, it's, it's failed. I don't have any power. Um, ultimately, we have to check in the bathroom area or in the kitchen area of the camper and make sure we don't have a GFCI resettable circuit breaker. For example, you might find these at your home around the sinks in your bathroom or around the kitchen in your, or around the sink in your kitchen and it has a test and reset button. Those are often tripped in a camper because we sometimes use the power that we would at our home. Um, I'm guilty. I have two hot plates that I plug into one outlet and I trip the breaker in my RV. So make sure that you're double checking if you lose power somewhere, they're not overloading a, cir a single circuit by putting too much amperage into one circuit. For example, a coffee pot, a toaster, and that hot plate I'm speaking about. If they're all on the same breaker or circuit, I'm sorry, you might need to move to a different point of the camper and plug in a, a, a a toaster or something in a different area if you're going to use those all at once. Yep. The just simple quick diag there is a, a lot, big failure to those is um, the outside outlet. A lot of campers don't have um, outlets on the outside. Uh, a little rainstorm or spraying of water or something. If that outlet gets wet, it's going to trip. So that's might why you lose power on the inside. Um, secondly, with that is just keep in mind if you do know what kind of uh, shore power you have, 30 amp or 50 amp. The 30 amps are going to have one GFI and that's usually in the bathroom. But if you do have a 50 amp, a lot of manufacturers are installing two GFIs. Usually one in the bathroom and one in the kitchen area. So if you do have a 50 amp and you still have outlets like, no, no, my GFI is not tripped, I, I tested it. Look for that second one. It could be underneath the countertop or hidden somewhere in the kitchen area. Okay. All right, moving along, uh, talk uh, briefly about generators. Uh, with motorhomes, generators are tied to the vehicle, so you can run the generator while driving down the road and have 120 electricity. Uh, what that means, you can run uh, a coffee pot if you wanted to down the road, the refrigerator on electric, uh, you can run a television uh, in a bedroom or something like that if you would like and have that 120 uh, power. When that generator is running, it does create voltage uh, like I said, 120, but also converts electric to 12 volt charging the batteries. Jerry, do you have anything to fill in on that? Nope, just with the generators on your drivables. Um, if they're running, a lot of times you have a big cab area, so your dash AC on a nice hot day isn't going to be able to keep up with that heat. So a lot of times people will run their generator um, and then turn their ACs on in their coach to help cool the whole entire coach down so it's nice and comfortable, especially if anybody's traveling with their uh, pet companions or <laughs> anything like that. Um, so here's where I like to talk about what's what's high voltage and what's low voltage for 120. What's, what's a safety range? So anywhere from 105 to 135 is that safety number, that safety range. You start dipping below the 105 volts for uh, VAC, uh, for VAC. Um, you, you should uh, contact the campground, you should contact your electrician, find out why your voltage is dipping so much, and then if it's 
uh, need to say spiking over 135 and, and staying there consistent, you should really get that checked out from a professional and figure out why that electric is having those highs or those lows so you don't damage components because there are a lot of small electrical components within uh, refrigerator boards, air conditioning boards, microwave boards, a lot of small parts and they can't take those highs and lows. So make sure you're aware of that. And that's where this guy again comes in handy. You're watching those highs of 135 and the lows of the 105. We need to stay away from those. And that range is acceptable. The only thing I wanted to touch base, just as Wayne was going through this, it just reminded me, and this is the confusing part about electricity, is uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm plugged in, but my refrigerator is not working. Well, a lot of components in RVs take 12 volt to um, control, but 120 to operate if that makes sense. So a lot of times you say my air conditioner's not turning on, but my microwave's on. Well, you might have a 12 volt issue because uh, like a blown fuse, something like that. And the, the boards and all these appliances do take 12 volt. Yeah. Pretty much the microwave is one of the only. So the first time somebody calls up or if I go to their site and they don't, they have a power issue, the first thing I ask them is, is the light on your clock on your microwave. If they say yes, okay, we have 110 power to the coach. So now we can kind of break it down from that. So that's the first thing you can kind of look at if you think you have a 110 power issue. Yeah, yeah, good point there. Uh, just a, a self-diagnosis for the customer out there. Yeah, that's great. All right, folks, we are not here to turn you into electricians. We are going to skip over volts, amps, and watts move into page 12 that information is all there and if you have any questions please feel free uh, to enter a question below so now we're going to jump into batteries 6 volt 12 volt parallel not parallel etc what's good what's best um, first recognizing what type of battery you have the most common battery we see in a in a trailer or towable camper is a 12 volt battery one battery typically um, wired uh, power ground, positive, negative. Um, and if we have two uh, 12 volt batteries, they're typically wired in parallel. So you're, you're keeping your 12 volt source, but you're just giving it a larger supply of amperage. You're giving it a boost of power. Longer lasting, if you're doing a lot of dry camping, uh, it's an option, optional way to go for you. Um, it's a marine battery, it's typically known as like a hybrid battery, but it works in both ways. Um, I uh, will do a, a fair amount of dry camping next year, uh, so I'm looking into doing a 6 volt system. And below you can see here on page 12 where I can wire up to 6 volt batteries in series and really gain a lot of deep cycle power uh, to get me through the nights and long days of not having a power source or a generator with me. So that is always an option. So first, if you're going to get into that uh, scenario of what do you have, uh, we have to recognize what battery you have. Page 13, there's a lot of batteries out there. It can be a little confusing, so you do have to do uh, your research. Um, you have to know the expectation. What do you want to do? What is your end goal uh, if you're really going to go to maybe a solar uh, and have a long discharge power life for batteries? Um, deep cycle, again, is, is what we're looking for in the RV industry. We're not looking like a car battery, right, Jerry, to no. start it. We're looking for a long uh, uh, use of energy. Uh, there are wet cells, and that's generally uh, what comes in a camper when you buy it or purchase it. Uh, unless you add, add or upgrade uh, to a gel or an AGM or a lithium battery. Um, they, they last quite a bit longer, don't require as much maintenance. Um, big question for me, Jerry, probably for you, is how long should my battery last? Well, there's a figure here on page 13, but it's ultimately, what are you using? What is drawing power from your battery while you're using the RV? And this would be when you're dry camping, you're not hooked up to 110 short core power. Um, it all depends on what you have running. For example, we have refrigerators now that have two fans in a slide room where those fans need to cool and help that doesn't have a fan at all that just uses natural air for airflow to cool the back of the refrigerator. Um, moving on to battery maintenance. 
So we're going to talk about battery maintenance. Uh, prevention is key uh, to battery maintenance. Uh, cleaning terminals, keep them lubricated with an anti-corrosion agent um, is your first line of defense. Um, cleaning uh, is best done with like a baking soda and a wire brush. Um, they do make a circular battery terminal brush you can purchase from a parts store. Uh, I know I certainly have one uh, from working in the industry. You can clean both terminals with uh, the brush. Just make sure you're being safe, uh, you know, because there can be some corrosion there. Um, wear a pair of glasses, wear a pair of um, uh, decent rubber gloves, some thick rubber gloves, so you're not going to get any uh, potential acid on your fingers. Uh, but just be safe about it. Wear some, uh, some older clothes, not some new clothes. Uh, and you should be fine. Uh, just uh, just, just uh, be safe. And the baking soda is an excellent cleaning paste for corroded terminals. Old toothbrush, uh, I've used one of those before. Uh, it's a handy applicating tool for the cleaner, for the paste in the corners and in the crevices around the top of the battery. Uh, after cleaning, uh, reassemble and add a dielectric grease. Uh, dielectric grease can be sold uh, or, or picked up at any parts store. Uh, it is uh, not a, a natural conductor uh, between the positive and negative power of ground. Um, but it will lubricate and keep them from, from uh, corroding ever again. You might see this on your automobile under the hood of your car. Uh, you're, you're looking to prevent something like the picture you see in page, on page 14. Um, like I said, auto parts stores sell this product. Um, always use distilled water when refilling your battery. Never uh, uh, pull water over the, out of the faucet, out of the tap. Always distilled. Um, uh, always have your negative battery terminal uh, removed when doing any type of maintenance to the battery, at least. I like to remove everything. Um, take the battery rate out, set it on a bench, um, get it off the ground, get it off from uh, uh, the, the frame of the vehicle so I can be close to it. Um, uh, take pictures or draw diagrams. This is a big one, right, Terry? <laughs> we get this a lot. Uh, a customer has four cables. They took four off. Not always does a cable uh, uh, represent uh, red being positive or black being negative. What does white, white go to? So always take a picture with your smartphone. That's uh, probably the best. Uh, for some of you who don't have a smartphone, draw a picture. Uh, but always know exactly where those terminals should hook uh, back up. Um, we have some examples here that we'd like to show you of functioning batteries uh, or non-functioning batteries uh, after being hooked up improperly, not maintained properly. Uh, and this isn't a scare tactic. How often do we see this? It's very, very, very rare. Uh, when following direction, but it can happen. So here's a couple of examples there uh, from a, a, a over-tightened connection there with corrosion. Uh, some that have been frozen on page 16 with a melted stud uh, from an incorrect cable connection on page 17. Um, one that lacked any water at all, just overheated. So when water, when we, when we charge our battery from 110 power with our converter or even a battery charger on a wet cell battery, that top layer of the water boils. And that's what sometimes you can smell as like a rotten egg or sulfur smell. And that water boils off until it's gone. That's why we need to maintain these batteries. And here's an example, one side of that uh, 12 volt battery, three of the cells are, are dry and got hot and melted. So. Pretty important to maintain your batteries. The uh, frequent asked questions on batteries for me is that they they just assume that they, how does my battery go dead? I've always had my coach plugged in. Well, that's how. Because a battery is designed to be um, used about 50% and then charged back up to 100%. So you could be causing damage to the battery by going to empty completely and then trying to charge it back up or having it plugged in constantly, creating a lot of heat, a lot of that um, water inside boils off, it, it turns into a vapor and a yep. gas. 
and then that's how they damage. Um, so it's and it's harder, especially when we get the uh, seasonal campers, because they just leave it plugged in and they go home for the week and they come back on weekends. It is hard, um, but just try to. I don't well, know, that's where maintenance check it. Maintenance probably most important, right? Yep. And yeah. then uh, some batteries are maintenance free. The other ones you can pop the caps off to check your water levels. And I would strongly suggest um, the seasonal camper to check your water levels at least two or three times, maybe even four throughout the season. Um, your weekenders maybe just a couple times because you're unplugging, you're driving down the road, you're using it, you're running slide rooms out, like that type. You're using it some battery power without being charged all the time of year. So the batteries are cooling down and then and being used and then brought back up to a charge. So that's the big maintenance thing there that I yeah. see on the field. <clears throat> a couple of the things that Jerry mentioned there is um, when a, a battery goes completely dead. That doesn't mean it's a junk battery. It means we have to put a full charge back in it. And uh, some of our battery partners and our vendors have trained us and proper battery charging. A proper battery, 12 volt basic wet system, wet cell battery, takes 24 hours on a battery charger to properly charge up to 100%. And unfortunately, that's what we, uh, as campers, sometimes don't have the time to do. We get the thing running, we plug it in at the campground, and we're functioning on the converter and it's 12 volts. So we could really be shortening the life of the converter when we plug in a camper with a, a, a dead battery uh, and not get it back up to its full potential. So that's very important to know is a proper charge with a battery charger, not necessarily the converter. The converter is more of a trickle charger than a battery charger at a, at a garage or a shop, etc. Now, when Jerry spoke about having a battery a 12 volt battery uh, charged nonstop, consistently plugged in. I've had a customer come in uh, and, and, and have this issue to where his battery keeps losing charge quickly and he was experiencing 50% uh, water loss in two months from being plugged in nonstop. So it can happen up to as quick as two months uh, I've seen from customer, customer knowledge. So. Uh, just keep an eye on that and know that maintenance is very important. It's a major part of your RV is the 12 volt battery system. Uh, moving on to winter storage. Um, a charged battery, a wet cell, a charged, fully charged battery that has no load on it uh, will not freeze. So that's the thing we have to ask ourselves. Do we have a load on our battery after we charge it when we put it away for the winter? Well, some do and some don't. In this case, we recommend just disconnecting the battery switch or unplugging the, the ground wire from the battery for the winter. And your battery will be fine in the spring. As long as there's no drain on that battery, it'll be fine. Other recommendations, take the battery in, put it in on the basement floor if you can, put it in a garage in a safe area. And the myth of being able to set a battery on concrete is no longer there. You can set a battery on the technology and the plastics of our batteries has surpassed the, the draining theory of them sitting on can concrete and being discharged. So don't worry about the battery on concrete anymore. Today's batteries are past that level. Just keep in mind, it all depends on what manufacturer, how they design the coach and how they design their electrical system. But a lot of times they will run a series of wires directly off from that battery that that battery disconnect does not turn off. And they do have a small, if almost not even visible on a meter, amp draw. Well, you're talking, it's not a big deal for, for during, using it during the season, but when the coach is gonna sit there for three or four months, that's gonna end up drawing your battery down. So even though a lot of customers say, oh geez, I have my disconnect off. Yeah, well this wire and this wire and this wire come off and feed this section that you can't disconnect. And so those, those components are drawing that down. So the safest, easiest way is to just disconnect the neutral wire. Me personally, I'm old school. I take the battery right out, take it home, put it in the basement way, the walkway, um, get be springtime, get it out, plug an actual, hook it up to an actual battery charger that automatically goes through the three phases of charging the battery. And then once it's completely charged, usually I put it on there about a week before I go get the coach. And then I just take the battery with me to go get the coach out of storage, 
hook it up. Make sure you hook up your positive negative wire correctly. The battery should be labeled and then you should be able to operate your coach and use it for the season. Uh, on a battery replacement, um, some of our larger fifth wheel uh, motor, or fifth wheel campers and our motor homes have banks of batteries, both for the chassis side and for the motor home side. And when, when having a battery issue, if uh, you find one battery to be bad in that bank of batteries, it is highly recommended. When I say bad, I mean failed. It no longer passes its electrical testing, etc. If it fails, it is highly recommended to replace all of those batteries because the other batteries, whether it's one, two, three, or four batteries in that bank, the other batteries that aren't testing bad are more than likely very weak because they've been making up the difference for that weak battery for longer than it's shown its head and given you a problem. So it's probably been ongoing for a while. So you gotta look into that. Um, it can be costly, so any kind of preventative maintenance to get you away from that is highly recommended. On RV solar systems, um, more and more campers these days are coming prepped for solar on the roof or have solar on the roof um, already. So what we need to do is uh, make sure we know like, what our expectation is. I spoke about that earlier, right Jerry? What is my end goal from being able to dry camp? What do I want to be able to use electrically through a solar recharge? And that's a big key. Uh, this one here is a 90 amp portable uh, suitcase model um, that'll basically on a sunny day keep all your batteries charged, run the refrigerator, um, etc. It, it, it's a good product. Um, and that's on a wet cell battery. Uh, no special batteries needed uh, to run one of these. Uh, it does uh, require uh, sunlight, obviously, but uh, if you want to boost your longevity, that's where we start talking about lithium batteries, AGM batteries, gel batteries, uh, multiple banks or uh, multiple batteries to build a bank in 6 volt or in 12 volt. Um, so that, that this is not uncommon. We are seeing more and more of this uh, in our area. Um, if you have any questions about solar uh, specifically, uh, ask below and we can answer those questions for you. Um, it's kind of a niche that we need to fit to your needs uh, as, uh, as your, your camp experience is needed to be changed. Yeah, with solar, I just like to try to make the statement to the customers that uh, Solar is really, it says on the labels and boxes or anything, it's a charging system or charging kit. So that all just depends on what your expectation is, like Wayne said earlier. Um, if you're using everything in the coach, that solar panel, depending on the size of it, is not gonna charge your batteries up. Uh, it, I like to use the word more t as maintain. It's kind of that way your expectations aren't blown out of the sky because like, well, geez, I, was, I had a four-day trip, and day one, my batteries were dead. Uh, the other thing to count for is weather so, or um, and landscape. So if you're parked under a whole bunch of trees, solar's really not going to do much for you. Cloudy day, not much going to do for you. So. Yep. And that's just what you need to do. You know, if you're out in the southwest, more than likely solar is going to be a very viable option for you. Not a lot of shade, not a lot of cover out there. Solar can be an option. We find this in our area for most of our campgrounds. Uh, or for those sites where uh, they're off the grid, there's more available uh, uh, opportunity to be under shade, under the trees. So this is an option where you can move it around and place it where you might be able to chase the sun that day, uh, for example. So uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good idea. Um, kind of uh, segueing right into this or off of this, our LED light bulbs, another opportunity to save power. Um, I know my, uh, myself, I have replaced all my bulbs in my home with LED um, for some of the same reasons we're gonna talk about today in your RV. Number one, there's no heat from them. Uh, incandescent bulbs that come into most campers um, uh, in the past, we're starting to see a change over in LED from manufacturers uh, right offhand, but uh, they create no heat, um, so it's safer. They're solid, so they last longer than any incandescent bulb. Savings, it's gonna cut down on usage of wattage in the camper, so electricity, if you're using this at, on your own power lot, uh, instead of 
purchasing a campsite, maybe you have a campsite at home, uh, out by the pond. It's gonna save, uh, save money that way and be uh, a little bit more financially uh, um, beneficial towards your electric bill. Um, energy, uh, as, I, as I say, it consumes a whole lot less energy than an incandescent bulb for dry camping, this is key. And then the environment. Uh, due to the low power consumption, the LEDs are better for the environment, contributing less to climate change. Jerry, you already have LEDs in your camper? I already do. They're all LEDs all the way through. Uh, a little bit cleaner light, brighter light. Yeah. Um, a lot of customers we're seeing, even if they have the condensed bulbs, they have available out there um, LED replacements. So it looks like a bulb, but it's an LED. So you can easily convert your inside or outside lights into LED. Okay, I think I'm gonna do that with mine this year. Um, on the surge protection, uh, there's, there's two things I like to highly recommend to any customer that purchased a camper, uh, thinking about purchasing a camper. Uh, probably the two things they can buy best for their camper. It's an RV cover to keep the outside conditions off the camper, rain, snow, ice, sleet, hail, all of that, uh, all of those items, keep them away from the camper. And then the second one is a surge protector. Um, we use surge protectors in our homes. Uh, right now, all my TV, everything is plugged into a surge protector at home. But we often forget that we're doing the same thing. We take our laptops, we take our cell phones, we take all of our toys with us, the iPad, when we go camping. But are we protecting ourselves from a lightning strike, from a, a brownout, et cetera? So one of the, one of the, the second thing I recommend is a well, some sort, and it doesn't have to be one of these, some sort of surge protection. Um, there's a lot of uh, products out on the market. Um, we have seen many come through, um, all being good products. You have to do your research. Again, what is your expectation of use? What's the end goal? Uh, for myself, I wanted to be able to know that my power was, uh, was good while I was camping, while I was at my campsite, uh, without having to go over and check the lights on the actual plug-in. The, the surge protector was on the back side of my RV, so I chose the watchdog that is Bluetooth signal to my phone that'll send me notifications of those 105 lows or 135 highs of electric. I think it's very important for me anyway as a camper, and I think it's uh, something that a customer uh, could, could really benefit from. You just don't want to, you want to keep anything that's harmful, um, maybe a dead leg, something breaks on the outlet of the campground. Um, you want to keep that from getting inside the trailer. Yeah, so the surge protector, everybody thinks surge high. But the, a lot of the newer technology, the surge, surge protectors are coming with a, what's it called, the EMS? E, e something, uh, sorry, I forgot what it is. But what it is, it's actually the low side too. So like Wayne said, a lot of these appliances that we have in our campers um, require circuit boards that to operate. Um, if they operate too long on a low voltage, damage can be done. Um, and that's when things stop working. Refrigerators, air conditioners. Air conditioners are usually a big one and I show up to a campsite. I first thing I do is I check power. Power seems loud. I'm like, man, when did Sir, when was the last time you noticed your air conditioner working? He's like, oh, 4th of July weekend. I'm like, oh man, that was 90 degrees out. Was this campground full? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, I bet you that's what it could be. So you're, it's, the way I look at them is surge protectors are a insurance policy on your, uh, all the nice uh, gadgets, all gadgets, gadgets yeah. that we have inside yeah. bushes that nowadays we can't imagine camping without. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with that, moving on to electrical adapters and cords, etc. So we've already gone through all of these cords and adapters you might be able to see, but let's talk about the actual extension cord that comes with your coach. We've had some customers tell us that um, their microwave uh, trips the breaker, it doesn't work. Um, come to find out, the camper was trying to be run on a 100 foot uh, 15 amp cord, which knocks down power. So we have to keep that in mind as well. An extension cord is Nothing else than that. It's an extended cord. It is flexible, so it is a little less conductive than a solid core wire. We do recommend that if you are going to be away from a, a, a campground outlet far, and so you're going back to the same one, we recommend that you carry a 30 amp extension cord or even a 50 amp extension cord. So you're not knocking down power, 
you're getting the most amount of amperage as possible to the camper. Yeah. From the coach with your short cord to the plug. If you do have to use an extension cord, the only thing I can recommend is using at least just one extension cord. So when we get over that, so your short cord is going to be around 20 to 30 feet, and then that um, extension cord is going to be about the same. They go about 25, 35 feet, somewhere around there. So once you get over that 100 foot mark, um, you're getting a lot of line drop, creating a lot of heat. That's how things can get damaged or tripping breakers and just struggling and kind of ruining your weekend. So it might be just simply enough as maybe, hey, maybe I got to reposition the coach so that all my appliances and um, devices operate correctly. Yeah. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, try to keep, so if your coach is a 50, try to keep with a 50 amp extension cord. Um, or for 30, stay with a 30 amp extension cord. It is okay to adapt down, but just remember that if you do adapt down to anything, that's what you're gonna be at total. So if you go from a 50 amp service down to an adapter to a 30 amp cord, and then back up to your 50 amp short cord, don't expect to be running both air conditioners. You're probably only gonna get one yeah. to work. Yep. All right, on to one of the last few things, items. Uh, RV converters, RV inverters, what's the difference? Uh, Jerry, I'm gonna kind of let you start on what the RV converter is. Yep, so an RV converter, every coach, I shouldn't say every, majority if not every coach, is going to have a converter in it of some sort of some size. Uh, what you are doing there is you are converting 110, 120 power down to 12 volt DC. Um, that's the majority of it. That's why every coach is gonna have one. That's how these coaches function. The newer technology that's coming out these days is now switching to inverted, with inverters in them. Uh, the main reason that is, is they're finding that manufacturers are installing residential refrigerators in them. So a residential refrigerator takes 120 power to keep cool. Well, how can you get 120 drive down the road. Uh, I don't think you can have an extension cord long enough to keep going from your house. So what the, what the inverter does is it changes 12 volt DC to 110, 120. Um, what that does is that keeps your refrigerators cool. Um, a lot of drivables will have inverters in them. That's going to be able to, so you might power a TV, um, something along those lines. So you can watch a movie or something like that going down the coach. So that's the so I have a small example of what an inverter is for most customers. They get these confused. So converter is the most common you know, thing in a camper. Inverters are not as common in each camper, depending on size, uh, cost, expense, and such like that. A simple inverter can be a, a plug that you would put in the cigarette outlet of a car and then plug your laptop into it. That's a simple inverter. And then from there, they just grow in size, in wattage, and what you can uh, power from that, converting the DC power of a car, or in this case, your battery in your camper, to 120 outlet uh, to plug in a microwave or some, something like that. So that's, that's trying to simplify it for you and understand what the two differences are. A lot of campers that boom dock, they, they are looking to invest in some type of inverter if they already have one. If they're boondocking and they have, say, um, a CPAP machine that they need to use at night, that's one of the reasons why. If they don't have, they can't run a generator at night for quiet time, um, or they don't have a generator and they're off grid, that they can run off from battery power throughout the night for that. Yeah. So that's, that's a big demand a lot of customers ask us to install or ask questions about, or how can I do this? Yeah, the next question here on page 24, is do you need an RV power inverter? And it's simply that, what is your RV lifestyle? If your RV lifestyle requires you to have power for a CPAP, then yes, you're going to need that. You're going to need one. Now there's options out there to do a 12 volt CPAP, etc. Maybe you want to brew a pot of coffee without running a generator, etc. Something like that, uh, all these options are out there and available. It's just your lifestyle with your RV and, and what suits your family the best uh, at this point. But the big one is the residential refrigerator. Yep, yeah, we see that a lot. Awesome. Yep. And just keep in mind, as if your uh, tow vehicle is set up from the manufacturer, if 
the charge wire is hooked up, has the relay and the fuse put in, and is charging. That is what's charging your battery, keeping your battery charged as you're going down the road, which is then going to keep your refrigerator cool. It is not going to cool it. If you try to cool your refrigerator on inverters, it'll last about three or four hours and then turn right off and your whole entire coach will be dead. Okay, so on to our last item here, page 25. Um, we give you a cheat sheet for amperage and usage of uh, each item. So an example there, a coffee maker is five to eight amps. Uh, an electric fan, an amp. Um, a curling iron, five to 10 amps. So you gotta remember if you're knocked down uh, for some reason and you're using a 15 amp household outlet, on your 30 amp plug, you're gonna run into amperage issues and breakers tripping very quickly. So that's why we're trying to use the maximum power possible. This is just a gauge for you to have an idea when you're out there in the field, when you're out there using the camper with the family to have better understanding of what produces what type of amperage and can give you uh, headaches in the near future. So with that, we're gonna move on to basics of RV electronics. On to the basics of RV electronics. What we're going to talk about are some uh, more techy uh, things that we have seen come into the market, um, ideas and uh, different tips and tricks here. Um, first is going to be our satellite TV. Uh, seems like uh, more and more requests on having televisions to be able to tailgate, watch the football game, um, watch the news, gotta watch Jeopardy. Um, gotta watch uh, Wheel of Fortune, right, Jerry? Um, so this is a, a really nice option or feature that can be mobile. This is one that will plug a coax in from a receiver, doesn't have to have an external power cord, like a 12 volt power cord or a 110 power cord. It's powered up by the cable. Uh, pretty easy to use and function, can mount it on a roof. Um, there are mounts to mount it on a ladder on the back of a trailer. Um, I have a mount over here uh, that's a tripod that you can put out in the yard if needed and mount the satellite dish to it. Um, yeah, that's pretty great. Um, so if you get a, there's a couple different times, and we will probably hit on here, is you get a, a roof mount. Um, that the satellite's going to be where you're parked. Wow. Yeah. Nice nature scene parked spot. I want to be under the trees, shade, the AC's going to run less. Well, now I don't have a uh, satellite reception. So this is great. You can get a 100 foot cord and coax a cable and just run it out and start moving that thing around and it'll automatically find the signal for you. Yeah, most most uh, phones, you can put a, get a compass. You can figure out where the southwest sky is. That's where most of these satellites have to aim or point, have an open skyline towards, uh, so you can walk around uh, and, and get it placed properly. A pretty nice feature to be mobile with that. Sorry, not on my phone. I'm actually, I found a, came across a good app. Sorry. What's it called? WineGuard. WineGuard, uh, what was it? Um, you can actually click on it. It's a satellite pointer or antenna pointer. It's it right up there so I can see. Oh, wow, it's just a screen of it. Oh, it's a pointer so it tells you where to go? Um, where to aim it? Yeah, if you download the app, you can, it just puts it in there and you just, it looks like your camera and you just kind of spin around and the satellites will show right up on the screen of the thing or even uh, cable or uh, antenna for your TV. So if you're getting, air antenna for your TV channel. So oh, I'll tell cool. you where those are located. That's helpful, excellent, excellent. So we have worked uh, already today on solar, so we're gonna skip through the next couple to pages and we're gonna start back out at rear observation. Um, majority of today's trailers are coming with backup camera prep. So basically it's like having a rear view camera for the trail, not your tow vehicle. Um, Furion is what most majority of these are coming mounted with or plumbed with. This is an example of uh, what we have. It's very easy install, um, has a camera, so you can talk to your partner in crime that's backing you up. Um, it makes it really easy. You're not the focal point of the campground anymore with uh, uh, poor backup skills. It makes you look like a professional just about every time. 
safe. Uh, you know, if there's anybody parked behind you at a gas station, you can tell. If there's anybody standing behind it at the gas station and you need to back up, uh, it, it gives you that uh, feel of safety. These are available in three different sizes. Uh, the smallest size is just an observation camera. The next two sizes, a five inch and a seven inch, they're available so you can have up to four cameras, one observation, two side mounted turn signal cameras on the trailer, and an internal observation, say into a toy hauler uh, to watch the motorcycle, to watch all the toys, to watch the kayaks, etc. And you can select that in the dash. This does have its own monitor. It does not work with the uh, vehicle's backup display. This is a separate monitor. Uh, pretty hot item and highly recommended in the industry. Um, I've, uh, I've been doing this now well, camping, I should say, for probably the last three years or so I've had my own coach. Um, I made the determination this year, after this year, I should say, for next year, that's going to be purchase number one. Um, it's not necessarily so much for the backing up. I kind of have that under wraps. It's more or less the traveling going down the road. You can see when you clear cars, merging lanes, um, you'll get a lot of uh, views from blind spots, stuff that you can't see. It takes a lot of that white-knuckled high intensity driving right away it just makes it a lot more comfortable for yourself and you kind of enjoy the weekend a little bit more um, the gas stations that's where i found it was is just trying to get in and out of the gas stations they make it really nice for the diesel for the diesel operators and the tractor trailers but for the gas um trucks or tow vehicles it's a little bit hard getting that coach in there especially for like me i'm towing a 36 footer back in there trying to get it turned around in a spot. And I usually have to make a couple different maneuvers and um, it, just, it just makes life a lot easier, a lot safer for um, us and whoever's around. So that's yeah. purchase yeah, number one this year. Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, next is uh, Lippert leveling systems. So there's several systems out there. Uh, 10 years ago, this system uh, came out and it was an automatic hydraulic leveling system. And it was six point. Now they're still on the market. However, a lot of coaches now have electric leveling. So it's all 12 volt leveling, which requires very good battery system. Um, whenever you're running this system, we do recommend always plug the camper in first, make sure your disconnect is on, and then run the system. Uh, they require a lot of amperage uh, to run the system. So we want to make sure that we're giving it all the power that we can and that would be optimal for proper operation. Now Jerry, I know you probably run into this out on the road. Is there any kind of tips or tricks that you might have for the customers outside of that charging or being plugged in? No, make sure you have good power. Um, just to kind of make it sound a little bit simpler is that if you have low voltage means high amperage. So with high amperage, things are going to trip out. You can trip a breaker, blow a fuse, um, something along that line. And then your uh, leveling system is not going to operate. The only other thing with leveling systems is just a general maintenance thing that people will kind of truly forget about. Like, oh, I ran it. That's fine, right? Uh, no, you actually, there is some minimal uh, maintenance to do as in lubing and um, just cycling periodically, just every now and then, just using it. But other than that, it's it's a very it's good product. Push of, push of a button. Yeah. Um, I like it to watch the guys that have it. They come back in, they get unhitched from their tow vehicle, and um, they're pretty much done. It's one push of a button, and every ounce is standing around going, oh man, I wish I was that guy. He's already just sitting there having a beer already. One of the so, items that I do think of when you just talk about backing in is we're talking about campground sites that are typically already level. Um, one of the, the, the common questions that I get when I'm here, or calls that I get when I'm here at the facility, is uh, we, we, camp the back, the, we back the camper in somewhere at our house or something, and we think we're level enough. Well, we can, out, we can overstroke both hydraulic and electric jacks because they can only extend so far. And if we're out of kilter, front to back, side to side, and we're not close to level, it could require one, getting a lot of blocks under the tires, using blocks under the jacks, or simply finding a more level area to auto level the camper. 
just because it's auto level doesn't mean that that trailer is always going to auto level depending on what the original uh, uh, landscape of the ground is. So that's very important to keep in mind that it's, it is auto level, but you have to be somewhat level to begin to get started. Yeah, you'll definitely want to, uh, you won't want to get away from, oh, I got a lot of level now, I don't need these blocks anymore, and you don't want to give them off your buddy, because you're probably most likely going to need them again at some point. Yep. Okay. And again, any questions, please, uh, please ask below, and we will get you an answer for those questions. Uh, on to the next, fireplace and heating solutions for RVs. Now I know this is one of Jerry's favorites because like he said and has talked several times, he does camp in, in, in multiple weather uh, options and I know that he uses fireplace majority of those cold nights. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's kind of a beginning season, end of season, uh, typically. Uh, Mine, for example, mine's in the back of the coach, so I just got to turn it up a little bit hotter. So I usually set mine around 84-ish, 82, 84, and just let the heat naturally drift up into the front of the fifth wheel. Um, but a lot of fireplaces now are coming central, so you can let them, uh, you can, you're going to have that down a little bit more. But if you're at a camp, campground and a site that you've got power and all that's, um, Pretty much the way, I, you, the way I think about it is, is uh, I've already paid for it, I'm going to use it. So I use power on my fireplace rather than running um, my furnace using up my LP. Okay. So they do. So it's a provides a dry yeah. heat because it's electric. Yep. So it's going to help dry any air, maybe any moisture in the air you might have uh, if it rained or you're kind of in a fall weekend or something like that. Um, and also, uh, another option is an air conditioner with a heat strip or a heat pump. Um, so essentially, your air conditioner that's on the roof of the camper could provide, not all, but it would be an option, an upgrade, could provide a heat source without using your propane. So if you do have that site that is a uh, seasonal site, uh, the electric is included in the payment, that might be an option for you to cut down on your LP usage for your furnace and that creates a more even uh, distribution of that electric heat uh, from your air conditioners. Uh, so that's an option as well. I know a lot of people use them in the motor home uh, 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 lifestyle that are in there uh, quite often. Okay. On to GPS. So GPS is probably something everybody's seen, everybody's got it, everybody understands it. Having a GPS that is familiar with the RV lifestyle is, is pretty important. Um, I know there's some roads in our area and uh, they have some small bridges, short bridges, and we cannot make it quickly to a campground. You went the one this fall, Jerry. Um, you gotta take an outsourced route. And if you didn't know about that, it could really become one, really expensive, um, or to a longer drive than expected out of the way to where some of these RV GPS systems will know the height of a bridge. You need to know the height of your trailer or your motorhome, but they'll know the height of the bridge and if you can make it underneath those bridges, they'll be labeled. Your standard GPS does not have that uh, on Google Maps or, or Waze, etc. So we do recommend this. If you're gonna do a lot of cross country traveling, probably a pretty Pretty nice uh, uh, item to have, mount it right in the dash of the vehicle, and you can have all of that. We have seen some customers come in this summer that unfortunately found out the hard way and had to replace the roofs of their campers, the air conditioners, etc. Uh, it's a major expense, uh, insurance companies involved. Um, just something that if you can uh, if you can get away from from something as simple as a GPS for the RV. Um, lifestyle, then we would highly, highly recommend that. Worst part about it is if you cause damage, you don't have to use your coach, it's here. And unfortunately, a lot of those coaches are here for a long time because uh, it's a massive overhaul of the roof. That's right. Uh, one of the cooler things out on the market, I think right now, moving on, is LED awning lights. Uh, I bought a used RV this summer, and I'm thinking about doing something for awning lights because the older trailers don't really put a lot of light out there for my kids to play at night, for me to play at night. Um, and, and it feels safe that we're not tripping over things. Um, so there's multiple styles out there. This is a carefree product. Um, th this changes colors. 
Uh, you can get them that will dance to the beat of the music that's playing, um, all kinds of different options. So if you don't already have an LED option on your, on your camper that you just purchased, this is something that can be installed relatively inexpensive uh, as opposed to the OEM if it doesn't have one. Yeah, on these pictures it shows on the awning tube. Um, I'm actually another person I'm thinking for next year. I want to get it so it's underneath the coach, so it gives it more of an accent lighting, and then it's not a bright light in your eye. So it'll make the coach look cool and be able yeah. to see your ground, so you're not tripping over anything in the dark. Yeah, my kids play under there, so it'll probably help <laughs> me find them. Um, but yes, it's again, it's an RV lifestyle, right? It's about what fits you, and this is an option um, that is both safety relative and fun at the same time. So we'd like to keep that in mind. Um, tire pressure monitoring systems. Uh, this is an area of the industry that's really taken off lately in the last couple of years and we're still seeing it grow. We're still seeing options out there for the campers. Now the only thing I, I see or the only thing that, that, that touches the road that's going to get you to the campground are your tires. So we want to make sure that everything touching the road is in great condition. And if we're guessing going down the road what, what we might have run over, uh, do we have a slow leak in a tire from we picked up a nail at that gas station that Jerry had to maneuver around, we would be able to monitor that at all times within the coach. So there are many examples. What we have here, and we're going to start bringing in some new examples uh, uh, from about January 1 on with a lot of new products. So you'll have to come in our parts departments and check those out. But what we have here is a tire minder. That's a product that can screw onto the tire. And Jerry can speak a little bit more to this, but it screws onto the tire, uh, monitors the tire pressure within the vehicle. And I know there's some in the OEM, so Jerry, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the OEM uh, uh, option. Yeah, mine were factory installed, so they're internal sensors. So it's, you, most of you customers would know that uh, a lot of your daily drivers, your vehicles have tire monitors in them. Um, that's what's giving you air pressure. Uh, the bigger thing with RV tire monitoring is we're also can monitor heat. So that's two different things that we're monitoring at the same time. Um, pressure obviously is a big thing. So everybody thinks, well, low pressure. Yep, if you get something stuck in your tire or you forgot to fill it up, you haven't checked it in a while, it's low, but also high. So the pressure can get too much into a tire and blow too. What causes that most likely is heat. So heat's gonna be from the road condition that you're traveling or something failing inside of that um, hub assembly. So it could be a bearing, it could be a brake, it could be another issue, something rubbing, um, different things like that. Um, I have in mind, and I can't imagine towing without it these days. Uh, that's the benefit of it, I can sit there and monitor it. I watched mine when I first got it set up. My back tires were heating up more and inflating. They had a higher pressure in them. I didn't really notice, but my hitch was set up too high, so I was pitched backwards. So I took adjustment on my hitch, and all four of my tires evened up with the same pressure and temp. Yeah. So I kind of saved myself there with either um, tire wear, because your tire's not as blown up as much, and the possible blowout. Um, and then I haven't, they haven't yet, but I haven't noticed an extreme one tire with a heat thing, So, um, but it's there for you safety-wise. The, probably the downfall of it, it's one of the downfall, uh, one of the negatives, I guess, is that it's sitting there, it's on my monitor in my uh, windshield, and as I'm driving down the road, I have a feeling like I'm paying more attention to that than the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but this is something you get used to, but it, it alarms. Um, I just like watching it. Um, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I, like I said, I can't imagine towing without it, especially anything that's over an hour and a half hour, mm -hmm. anything like that. You're gonna see. So just like the Furion, the Furion backup camera is coming pre-wired, yep. but you still need to purchase the camera and the monitor. Yep. Uh, we're seeing uh, new campers coming in this year, just this fall, uh, from some of our manufacturers that have a tire monitoring system pre-installed. Um, so you basically got half of it wired up, you just need to buy the second half to make it functional. Um, what Jerry's talking about is his came with the full system, and we're getting those in multiple different systems. 
Um, the new one coming through that we're seeing that it is on a camper is called TireLink, and that's by Lippert or LCI. And that one links up to any cell phone through an app, and that will notify you with any kind of high temperatures or any high pressures, low pressures, etc. So that's not another monitor, but it is done through your cell phone, your smartphone. So that's an option. Look for that on the side of the campers when you're when you're uh, searching for your new uh, dream camper, uh, and you'll see those items label on the side of the RV. Yeah, and they're definitely add-ons too. It's just as simple as removing a cap on your valve stem, screwing these on, and then programming the monitor to it. And then just... Okay. Speakers, um, I didn't have one of these speakers available, um, but one of the biggest speakers we see are the Furion portable little boombox speakers. Um, and again, pre-wired from Furion in a majority of the campers that we do sell and offer or add it on after market uh, is the Furion radio speaker. Uh, it's a charging port dock station uh, for charging the battery inside the speaker. Then you can take it, clip it to your belt buckle, uh, carry it around with you, etc. So not only would it work for you at the camper, you leave the camper and go to one of the kids' soccer games, you can take that with you, play some music at the soccer games, at practice, whatever you might feel you need but it docks up inside the RV, so it's always with the camper, so you don't have to worry about where you might have placed it last. I know I've lost my fair share of those portable Bluetooth speakers. I think that's a really good option. I do have one of those either, uh, just uh, limitations on parts right now, but uh, uh, please look us up, and, and um, if you have any questions about those, we can help you out in our parts departments. And, We've already spoken about surge protection. Um, and that's it, folks, for today. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, have a great afternoon.